Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all. My name is Aliya Apkenova, and I will be moderating this session, which is devoted to the cooperation between family and schools. In particular, today we are discussing the implementation of family skills programs in school settings. Before we begin, I have a few suggestions. Each presenter will have a total of 10 minutes for their presentations. And if you have any questions for the presenters, please use discuss feature in our application. We will address your questions after at the end of our session, after all presentations. And now let's please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Debbie Allen. Dr. Allen is an international consultant for UNODC, and she works across Central Asia, Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan. Dr. Allen is one of the authors of the UK version of the Strengthening Families program which has been implementing in Kazakhstan. Over to you, Dr. Allen. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. Um, good afternoon to you all um, and uh, um, uh, a good morning from here in the United Kingdom. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning um, and um, I hope that the presentation I give will add some further knowledge to what you already have. Um, I'm going to be looking at the cultural adaptation of the Strengthening Families Program 10 to 14 and that really for me is a journey across Central Asia and beyond. The journey started for me in about 2004 in the United Kingdom uh, when I was asked to adapt the program to meet the needs of a UK audience. So a little bit first of all about the Strengthening Families program. What I'd like to do is give a brief overview, discuss whether some people say it's a substance misuse program, but I'm, I would like to answer that. How the program looks at reducing risk and building protective factors and how the programme fits together. And then I'll go on to look at the cultural adaptation journey across Central Asia and beyond. So the Strengthening Families programme um, is a seven week evidence-based programme to help families with young people aged 10 to 14 prepare for the teenage years. We know that adolescence is a time of great change for young people and it's a time of many challenges when young people are doing more independently and have less concerns with their family. The Strengthening Families Programme has seven two-hour sessions for parents and young people. Parents and young people meet separately for the first hour and then spend the second hour together doing family activities. Group size can range from eight to 13 families, so you can have quite a large gathering of up to 30 individuals sometimes. Three Strengthening Families Programme trained facilitators are required to, to facilitate this programme. And you can have helper support as necessary. So the Strengthening Families Programme 10 to 14 is a whole family approach. Now, um, I say whole family because many um, interventions work with the parents. Many interventions work with the young people. This programme works with the family as a whole bringing the family together. Um, the aims of the programme are to reduce alcohol and substance misuse and other behaviour problems associated in adolescence. And this is achieved through improved skills in nurturing child management by parents and improved interpersonal competences amongst young people. The objectives are to increase parenting skills, so we build on the skills that parents already have, build life skills in young people. And very importantly, work to strengthen the family bonds that are already there, getting parents to see things from young people's point of view and young people from the parents' point of view. And very importantly, we identify the risk factors and we help young people develop protective factors as they enter adolescence. So, um, 
is the Strengthening Families Programme a substance misuse programme? And I would say to that, no, it isn't. And in fact, we defocus almost entirely away from discussing substance misuse and concentrate instead on the processes which sustain family life and pr promote healthy development. Young people only look at drugs and alcohol in briefly in two sessions they do. Parents likewise. The approach is quite different with this programme. So in that process, it recommends itself not just or not even as a, a primary substance misuse programme, but as a generic approach of equal interest to mental health, crime prevention, education, child welfare and family services. And the results of the randomised control trials evidence that these are some of the outcomes that we've been seeing. The Strengthening Families programme is, is really built around three models. One, the biopsychosocial vulnerability model, which looks at the skills and families that um, families have can buffer against the stresses they face within the family. There's the resiliency model, which is concerned with the protective processes and the nurturing of life skills in young people, such as managing emotions, identifying stress, how you deal with that stress, planning and solving problems. And the family process model, which theorizes uh, that the impact of economic stress on parents and its subsequent effects on mental health and well-being have negative impacts on parenting, which in turn, of course, have impacts and implications for young people. So studies, these are large randomised control studies. Um, I'm not talking about those here, but I have links for them if anybody needs to see more of them. Show that young people who've participated in the programme are significantly less likely to have problems with alcohol, substance use, aggressive and hostile behaviour, truancy, cheating, peer pressure. They also have been shown to have increased school attendance and better school attainment. And the interesting thing about this programme, which is known as a brief intervention, it's seven weeks, but the difference between the two groups, so the Strengthening Families programme and the control group, becomes more significant over the years, um, up to four years and more after the intervention. So whatever we work with the young people, whatever we teach them, they take forward as they go through adolescence and those skills build. So looking at the um, adaptation program and the process I've been through, um, my journey started at Oxford Brookes University, as I said, at about 2004. I'd been working as a researcher um, and I was asked to look at the cultural adaptation and dissemination of the program, which started in 2006. I was approached by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime to facilitate the Strengthening Families Programme training and implementation and rollout in Brazil in 2013 and returning in 2014. Following the success there, in, 200, in 2015, we were invited by the UNOC to consider introducing the programme to countries in Central Asia as part of a pilot study. The programme was one of a number of evidence-based interventions introduced to those countries. The same international trainers, that's myself and my colleague, um, Professor Lindsay Coombs, facilitated each of the trainings, thus ensuring fidelity of the training model. So we know that everybody we trained had exactly the same preparation and training. And that's very important when you're looking at fidelity. Group sizes were approximately 20, 30 professionals. Participants included teachers, psychologists, psychiatrists. The Strengthening Families Programme training delivers each of the 21 sessions of the programme. So that's each of the seven parent sessions, the youth sessions and the family sessions. And it's participatory in nature, as everyone who's undertaken the training will tell you. Participants are actively involved in the training. They play the games, they demonstrate the exercises. And this allows them to get an experience 
as the families they will be delivering to. Time is dedicated during the training for questions, discussions and concerns, which is a vital part of the process. If you're introducing a program that's been developed in a different country, it's really important that facilitators have a chance to say, how does that work? How's that going to work in my culture? In each country, the pilot programs were then facilitated with groups of families. In Kazakhstan, the international trainers were very honored to be able to observe the new facilitators working with families um, and provide feedback, um, which was a great privilege for us. We couldn't do that with all the trainings, but we did it with quite a few. After the facilitators um, had completed the seven week program, any cultural changes that facilitators and families felt were necessary to meet the cultural needs of each country were discussed. The international trainers were involved as necessary as questions arose, again, to ensure we had program fidelity. If we don't have fidelity, we can't guarantee the outcomes. But without exception, these were surface adaptations, nothing to do with the pure content, the essential elements of the program. So, for example, if topics represented a challenge to the customs or tradition of a country, the topic could be introduced in a different way. In Iran, we had um, difficulties talking about personal development with young people and their relationships. But that was fine. In Iran, they decided to have an open discussion. So it wasn't excluded. It was just introduced in a different way. The most recent training in August this year, um, it was a delight for me, was in Kazakhstan, and it was the fifth training in the country. In Kazakhstan, there are a core group of highly trained facilitators and very experienced trainers, thus capacity building is facilitated. The programme is being rolled out, as you know, by Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools with the collaboration of um, the UNODC with my trainings to all regions of Kazakhstan. It's a wonderful development that the Strengthening Families program now forms part of psychologist training in Kazakhstan. And I have to say it sets an example and a model um, internationally in the work that's been done. A recent success, I think, for everyone was the Strengthening Families program was translated to the Kazakh language. Again, that was a wonderful development I was proud to be a part of. The pilot programs were evaluated using program pre and post studies, facilitators and families were also interviewed, thus the mixed methodology of qualitative and quantitative data was collected. Most recently, an independent study was carried out in Iran in June this year, in collaboration with the World Health Organization, which highlighted the positive findings and acceptance and popularity amongst families and facilitators in the health setting. And it also looked at the feasibility of the program scale up. So much as Kazakhstan, this is being now worked on and in Iran. And um, uh, finally, uh, far from being just uh, uh, Iran and Kazakhstan, I've mentioned um, in the region, we've uh, carried out trainings in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kurdistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan. Um, so I'm going to conclude by saying what a privilege that journey has been for me. Um, and I'm delighted to see that success of this program and thank everybody for their hard work in implementing this program um, across the region. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. We have seen the effectiveness of the program ourselves and our next speaker, Victor Sosin, will share some results of the Strengthening Families Implementation at School. Viktor Nikolaevich is the principal of Nazarbayev Intellectual School in Taldykorgan, and his school has already benefited from the program. Viktor Nikolaevich. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh... In my presentation, I will share the experience of our school in implementing the Strengthening Families program. I will provide the general information in the context of our school. The purpose of the presentation is to discuss the impact of the program on the relationship between parents, learners, and school. 
and I will support results of our observations with quantitative and qualitative data using survey and interviews of our students, parents, and staff. Uh, I will skip a couple of slides uh, because uh, Dr. Uh, Ellen uh, presented a uh, very thoughtful uh, description in detail so, of this program, but I will start with this moment uh, that um, taking into account uh, the distance learning in the previous academic year, uh, this program in our school was adapted to online format, which became known as We Are Just a Family course. It also consists, can, uh, consisted of seven uh, sessions, like Strengthening Families program, but uh, also but they were um, joint sessions for families uh, together, parents and students. Although one session was supposed to last no more than 45 minutes in practice, parents and students were so involved that it took much longer to share thoughts and discuss results. During three years of uh, implementation of the program, our school trained three psychologists and teaching curators. It helped us to make a large coverage of participants. We trained 246 learners and 271 parents, where 98% uh, of participants regularly attended weekly classes. The opportunity to take the course remotely the previous year significantly increased family involvement. Thus, in the online format, we covered 169 students and 164 parents. Uh, we conduct two questionnaires of parents uh, each term, each, each course, before and after the program. Comparison of the results confirms that parents are noticing their changes. For example, after the course, the number of parents increased who wait uh, until they cool down and only then solve problems with child. Remember that it is very difficult for a child of their age to get along with themselves, help their child to understand the rules of the family, allocate time for the family to get together and have fun, tell their child how they feel when their child misbehaves, and allocate time one on one time, uh, dedicated time uh, with their child, talk to a child about their future, plans without criticism. Uh, for us, it was also important to see uh, the impact of the program to families during the distance learning period because the lockdown created an opportunity to apply the acquired skills in real stress situations. First, uh, there has been an increase in positive communication within the family. Many parents uh, shared this aspect and the following quote illustrates this where a parent could have an open and fruitful conversation with her daughter after the course. Moreover, the parent feels that her daughter gradually talks more about things that bothers her in school and beyond. Uh, second finding is that, that there is, has been an increase in uh, positive communication within the family. Many parents share this aspect. Uh, and in, in this slide, for example, uh, the, uh, oh, sorry for that. Here we are talking about the number of family conflicts for uh, this decreased. Yeah, this observation was well supported by students and parents. For example, a student comments it like this showing that the skills developed at the course allowed them to manage family conflicts during lockdown when the whole family had to spend weeks together. Moreover, according to the experience of the school psychological service coordinator, there were no requests for misunderstanding of the part of parents and for intra family conflicts from the learners who completed the program. Uh, third, we noticed that youth depression reduced uh, here, parents express the confidence that their children no longer hesitate to ask any kind of help if they need, including psychological support. The fourth, use aggression reduced. Interestingly, that parents provide examples of specific practices they use in families to regulate relationships, implying that the program equips families with important tools to regulate youth aggression. 
The next one is that youth cooperation expanded and the number of pro-social friends increased. Uh, this aspect was well supported by curators who observed rapid cooperation in newly formed classes of students of the seventh grade after the program. For example, the curators noticed positive change to changes in the socialization of learners, the development of their leadership qualities and proactive behavior, as it can be seen in this quote. This, the sixth, that the social competence of students improved. Parents show that children uh, can better evaluate situations and determine what is expected or required and to select social behaviors that are most appropriate for the given context. Moreover, a um, great curator uh, noticed that the children became more open, anxiety and fear associated with the educational process decreased because parents began to understand and support their children more and learners from a positive attitude toward their parents. The last but not least, positive parenting skills have improved. Parents participated in the program not only made friends with each other, but also created a favorable atmosphere among the parents of the entire class. The actors, organizers who joined the recreation for children and parents participate in cultural and sports events, in events organized by the school as well, and showing their initiative conduct master classes for class learners. So, for example, here, dads took part in school volleyball competitions and parents made joint tourist trips. Uh, in my opinion, this is a great example of a program that scientifically based and touched out from the beginning to the end, including training program or facilitators. Various organizational aspects were taken into account as well, like, for example, recruit, recruitment of participants, schedule, uh, brochures, coffee breaks, um, etc. And all the materials necessary for training are provided. Um, it is in a strong family that the foundations of human morality are laid, norms of behavior are formed, the inner world of individual qualities of a person are revealed, and the family contributes not only to the formation of personality, but also to the self-affirmation of the person, stimulates their social creative activity, reveals their individuality, and this program as an is an experience that uh, we would recommend every parent of a teacher, teenager to have. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Viktor Nikolaevich. Dr. Malouf is a coordinator of the Global Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation Program at UNADC headquarters. And today he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on social and emotional learning programs in terms of drug use prevention. Doc Dr. Malou. Hello, everyone. Uh, a big thanks for NIS for inviting you UNODC, the Office of Drugs and Crime, the Drug Prevention and Health Branch at headquarters, Vienna, to join this event. I'm very honored to be with you on this event and to share with you some slides that would hopefully add more insight to the great work and great presentation that are being um, spearheaded nationally. So my presentation is going to focus around the social emotional learning and its link to the uh, prevention standards of UNODC. So with that being said, I will um, go straight ahead for the, for the sake of time with the presentation uh, at hand. So um, the prevention standard, just to as, as, a, as a mean of context, it's very important to remember that the prevention standards are um, linked to support sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goals um, and, and their link to uh, the science of prevention is, is something you, we, we need to account for in our work. And I will say into more details why this is of importance in, um, in the context of this presentation. Why increasing availability and coverage of quality science-based prevention could help the sustainable development goal of a country between now and 2030. And why exactly there's a target 3.5 that specifically focuses on that. We also focused on supporting member states in their own commitment, the joint commitment that they have put in the General Assembly special session on the world drug problem, where they focused on, focus, on, on putting more evidence-based programs of reducing demand for drugs, prevention and treatment-based programs. 
how prevention standards are standards that have been developed jointly with WHO. And you are, uh, probably the context of COVID-19 is a very good reference point to think about the value of relying on science, especially in science that's based on WHO standards when it comes to prevention. What do the prevention standards say? First of all, it's important to note that not investing in prevention is not a question of affordability. Now, especially the era we're living in, we understand that not investing in prevention does not come at no cost. It is costly. And prevention is cheaper than no prevention. And prevention is, of course, better than cure, but cure is also something important to account for when it comes to treatment of drug substance use disorder. But the main message is prevention needs to be put in place as a system of support, but not any prevention. We're talking about prevention that is science-based. There's no need to improvise. There are lots of programs that have been passing the WHO standards of prevention, proving that they can prevent substance use that you can put in place. Another important point is that prevention goes beyond raising awareness and raising fears about drugs. That could work for a specific age group or for a specific subgroup of population. But prevention goes beyond this. And I'll talk into more details about this. But as a mean of example, if messaging about the danger of drug work, you would have seen it successful in the field of cigarette or smoking prevention, for example, where the actual message is on the box that people are paying for and buying it. The fourth message is just saying no is not enough because just saying no assumes that th there's a free and independent choice that the child or the young adolescent isn't taking when it comes to drug use. And just asking the child to say no is not enough. It's just scratching the surface. The fifth message is when we focus on prevention, it's important to think about the individual, how we can help that individual grow in a healthy and safe way. Because if you focus on the drug, then the set of interventions that we can consider moving forward is completely different than we focus on the individual and helping the individual grow safe and healthy. And that's why sometimes it comes as a surprise for policymakers that many programs that are based on the evidence based of WHO do not discuss drugs, but they help the growth, intellectual, language, cognitive, social, and emotional competencies of the children and the youth in when they grow up. And this sort of thinking requires a multi-setting sort of support to, to help the kids in different ages of development from birth onward, which is also a revealing thing that you can prevent drug use by focusing on programs that can be as early as birth. The value in this sort of thinking and this culture is the fact that these vulnerabilities that link to early substance use are not unique to substance use, but they also are linked to violence, delinquency from schools, um, uh, dropout from schools, mental health problems, violence against children, and more. Uh, so it's a common vulnerability matrix. And the most important message is the worst outcome when it comes to not relying on science when it comes to prevention is not an ineffective response, but more a neutrogenic re response, meaning that the worst thing that can happen is that your program has caused substance use to initiate. And that's why we're focusing on this change of culture. For those of you not convinced that this is a developmental program, I go back to just like a slide that shows you like when is the age of initiation of substance use in any country of the world, regardless of the substance. Substance use is, is initiation comes between the age of, let's say, 12, 13 and 20, 21. And if initiation did not happen within that developmental period of time of growth, the chances of initiating substance use at a later age is close to zero. Meaning that if it was a free independent choice, you could have made that free independent choice at any point in time. Whereas it's only within this developmental period, there is something about the brain neuro, um, ne neurological development that is happening there that is important to account for. And then if you focus on the substance, of course, you have a substance specific thing at what age, but the thing is deeper than that. The main message is vulnerability wise, People have different genetic characteristics, have different mental health status, different reactivity to stress, their logical development on a person under their skin. And these people live in families that have a good functioning or bad functioning, involvement, monitoring, harsh abusing, uh, abusive parenting, uh, domestic abuse, I don't know. Lots of things can happen within the family and they affect the individual and the school as well. Um, you know, the climate, the, the attendance, everything like this kind of, the school is a very influential social institution too. And the peers. 
And these micro structures also live in a larger context. So a family that lives in a context of poverty is different than another family in displacement, war, uh, violence at the community level, other social environment, in the school, the same thing. These micro structures are affected by the larger macro environment. And that micro environment also affects the personal character. So there is an interactivity between these structures that lead to this vulnerability and the potential of substance use. But also important to know that these vulnerabilities are, as I mentioned, linked to something beyond just substance use. So imagine an inattentive child that has poor reactivity to stress, living in a family that is abusive or neglectful, in a poor school environment, and in a context of, let's say, violence at the community level. Helping that child by just saying no or giving them information about drugs is not enough. Something deeper needs to be done. And that's why we work on providing prevention that is based in a social context, healthy socialization context, from growth onward, from birth onward. And every developmental stage requires a different sort of programs that help the child pass this milestone of development in a healthy and safe way to go to the next one. And this is where we talk about programs that have been demonstrated to be effective on preventing drug use, starting from the time when the child is in the womb of the mother to early infancy up to adulthood. And you can imagine how richer these programs are and how more effective they are. You see diversity of colors. Some of the programs are in green, which is universal. Any, any family can, any child can benefit from it. Some of them are in yellow, meaning they are, in the, they are selective, meaning for a subgroup that are higher vulnerability than the normal population. And some of them are indicated, meaning intervening at periods where symptoms are starting to show before it goes into something more elaborate. And you can imagine and you can see the amount of packages and programs that the school can provide and how it kind of interacts with other social institutions that can further support the school in such programs. I'll focus on, on two age groups because of the lack of time and the lore of school in this perspective. But a critical age is the early school years, six to 11 years, where parenting skills programs are important, whether it's universal or selective. And Kazakhstan is one of the countries that has very rich programming when it comes to this. And we were very lucky to be working with, uh, uh, with you as UNODC on this perspective. Personal and social life skills are also very important at this age. And I know that Kazakhstan also have these programs in place. Classroom environmental pro uh, inv uh, change, uh, programs are important. These are programs that change the management of the classroom settings. And policies to keep children in schools. These are mostly for at-risk at groups. These are programs, packages at early age uh, development, early school years that can already help in preventing drug use. Personal and social skills at this age, of course, we're talking about things of recognizing the emotion, the emotions of others, uh, healthy socialization, how to say things without hurting the feelings of others. You understand this kind of values of programs to build healthy relationships with others and resist social uh, difficulties. But also, of course, there are programs out of schools where uh, life skills through leisure time and beyond can be important, and especially if there is out of street children. We're also, uh, I think Kazakhstan is one of the um, <coughs> countries that are benefiting from Line Up, Live Up, which is a program that prevent, produces life and uh, social skills through sports-based activities that can be implemented out of school settings as well. And when it comes to early adolescence, Family skills remain important, but of course, different family skills are needed at this age. And also, uh, Kazakhstan, one of the countries that have these pro packages in place. But also, life skills and social skills, which call the preventive education, is very important at this age. Different life and social skills, resisting social pressure, changing normative belief, uh, becomes very important. School policies on substance use, program at school that are attachment, keeping children in school, addressing social vulnerability, address mental health disorders, and mentoring. You can see the diversity of things that can be done in early adolescence that are in line with the prevention science and in line with the you know, CWHO standards that can go beyond just like discussing drugs and saying no to drugs that can help children overcome their vulnerability. But you can see these strategies, how come they help also the educational sector beyond just preventing drug use. You can imagine how much they can enrich the educational sector, sector as well, while serving the perspective of preventing drug use. So some of these packages can be universal, selective, indicated, but all of them have strong evidence in line with prevention standard to help support the healthy growth of, of kids. Family is key and family packages can be implemented in school and support schools, but schools can also prevent by working on life and social skills and, and beyond. 
my colleagues are going to talk about family skills, so I'm not going to go into the details, but you can imagine how family skills are linked to more than one sustainable development goal. And prevention is not um, independent from treatment. So, yeah, we have a large diversity of countries and we overcome the barriers. So basically any parents, any family anywhere in the world can benefit from the science that relate to uh, healthy development. The relationship with the caregiver and the children is universal is universal and Kazakhstan has produced and supported the evidence globally in this regard. This is just an overview of some of the publications we have done to change the culture and prevention to share with you. I'm not going to go into the details, but these are for reference and I keep the presentation with you for your references. But also my colleague Ala will talk about our work we're doing with refugee and sort of parenting under stress context in general, because that's the extreme side of parenting under stress. We're all parenting under stress now and under COVID-19, but refugee work was very insightful for us to see how we can help them and how to help other parents parenting under stress. And these chapters are coming in. Strong family is a package that we have uh, on parenting in stressful situation. Family United is a more universal package. The science of affection, listen first, is a very important, interesting campaign that not just parents to think about things they take for granted sometimes when it comes to relationship with their children. And Central Asia in general, and Kazakhstan is not uh, also unique in this, but among all, all Central Asian countries have benefited from such experiences. Family skills is linked to several outcomes. That's why the return is more than 10 to 1. Life and social skills in general, social emotional learning is a very interesting package in line with the standards. I leave on this note to tell you like this sort of work to go back to where we started is evidence based program that if you approach it from a drug prevention angle is supporting sustainable development goal because of the healthy and growth of the children and preventing drug use, but also these same programs support many other sustainable development goals, including gender, education, SDG 4, and especially for us, as you already see, SDG 16, when it comes to violence and violence against children. I will leave the, with this note because I don't want to delay you. My time is limited. Thank you very much. And I ask again for uh, inviting you and to join you. We look forward for further engagement together and support and collaboration for the healthy and safe development of youth in, in Kazakhstan, whether it's through its life and social skills or whether it's through family skills program. Thanks again for the invite. Much appreciated. And my colleagues from uh, from their expertise will add more insight, especially on the family skills program. Thank you very much. Dr. Ala Elhani. Dr. Elhani is a global humanitarian consultant at UNODC, as well as honorary research associate at the University of Manchester. Dr. Elhani. Good afternoon to you all from the UK. It's really great to be with you. I am Ala Al Khani, and in my presentation, I am going to introduce you to the various UNODC family skills resources, including Strong Families, Family United, and our work implementing these programs globally. Of these programs, I'm both a co developer and also a master global trainer. The relationship that parents have with their children can be the most primary, most important factor in their future well-being. That's in their emotional and mental health development and very significantly in reducing the likelihood of children and youth becoming engaged in risky behaviours like substance misuse and criminal activity. All families in all contexts can benefit from family skills programmes that aim to strengthen family protective factors like communication, trust, problem solving skills and conflict resolution. Families that take part in family skills programs are much more likely to have better mental health, physical and social outcomes in their future. So we agree that families can greatly benefit from family skills programs. But what about families experiencing parenting under significant stress or challenge circumstances? Families living in low resource areas or families with an ill family member? Parents going through a hard divorce or families going through a global pandemic like COVID? So what do these types of families need? Well, science and research on family skills implementation work tells us that families need the same things that they need outside of extreme stress contexts. 
They need resources with the same components that form the basis of all family skills programmes. But during stress, caregivers need these more than ever. The need to focus on relationships and strengthen family protective factors is even more important for all family members um, during high stress situations. So in addition to these main protective factors of communication and problem solving skills and conflict resolution, we also need to really focus on how to deal with adult and child stress. Um, the importance of listening and communicating with children, the value of using both love and limits in our parenting approach and ways to encourage positive behaviour and also techniques to discourage misbehaviour. I'm going to touch on briefly the background of our UNODC work implementing family resources globally in very high stress contexts as these feed the development of both Strong Families and Family United. So prior to developing Strong Families and Family United, UNODC had a lot of experience in developing resources for families living in many different contexts, including high stress contexts. I'm going to give you here two examples of initiatives here that are a collaboration between UNODC and the University of Manchester. And these really help to build our knowledge and feed our experience in the development of our family resources that I'm going to share with you shortly. Firstly, is our efforts in the development and distribution of a parenting information leaflet for families living inside a conflict zone in Syria. Of course, living in a conflict zone in an ex is a really extreme example of a stress context, context where parents and children are really facing many, many new challenges. The parenting leaflets that we develop describe the different types of behaviour that children might go through as a result of exposure to extreme violence, displacement and loss, and really helpful basic tips on providing warmth, safety, um, giving praise, spending time with children and trying to maintain a routine. This led to a unique trial, which we called the Bread Wrapper Study, in which we posted 3,000 of these urgent parenting leaflets and questionnaires to families inside Syria living in a conflict zone. The leaflets and the pens were wrapped in packaging for bread and delivered by an NGO. And we also added a questionnaire into the wrappers to get feedback from families on how useful these leaflets might be. Over 80% of the internally displaced caregivers rated the overall usefulness of the leaflet as quite a lot or a great deal. And this really highlighted that how even during extreme stress, caregivers were really engaged in parenting information. In our second example of tools developed for context of high stress, here we have a second, we have developed a light touch intervention, which consists of a parenting booklet and an associated conversation group seminar called Caring for Your Children Through Conflict and Displacement. So here parents receive a booklet to demonstrate the key parenting skills in a really simple and engaging way, such as building parental confidence, self-regulatory skills, and enhancing child and family psychological well-being. We conducted a randomized controlled trial of this intervention with 119 families in the West Bank, Palestine, many of whom had been displaced several times. And we found that both groups, those that took part in the, in the intervention and those in the control showed a trend of reduction in both child behavior problems and also an improvement in parenting and family adjustment over time and seemingly more so for the intervention group. So these ex experiences with these interventions and our collaboration with the University of Manchester have really helped shape the Strong Families and the Family United programme. So what is Strong Families? Strong Families is an evidence-based multi-session family skills programme designed for families parenting under stress with the aim to improve family skills, child well-being and general family mental health. It's designed for families with children aged 8 to 15 and it was developed ensuring it to be brief, so it's only three sessions over three weeks and it's light which requires a very light infrastructure that's easy to mobilize and train 
and training is aimed at lay people from different backgrounds. It's also really suitable for low resource settings and it's very cost effective and uses very minimal um, materials. The philosophy of the Strong Families program is that all families have strengths and skills. Even families facing extreme stress, you will find caregivers who are really trying their best. This program is aimed at making parenting easier. All parents can recognize what might be useful for them from the skills learned in this program. And this program was developed to make parenting easier and to improve the general well-being of children and their caregivers. So in this slide here, we have an illustration of the flow of the sessions. The program runs over three weeks and there are both caregiver separate sessions, child separate sessions and family separate sessions. When designing the Strong Families program, the first step was developing this logical framework to map out the short term and the long term objectives of the program. And as you can see here, there was a real focus on the short term goals of improved caregiver confidence in family management skills, improved parenting skills, also things like reducing aggressive and hostile behavior and an increased capacity to cope with stress but also on the fundamental long-term goals in a reduction in violence, as well as substance abuse and risky behaviours, and improved mental health for children and for their caregivers, as both a short-term and a long-term goal. So here we have our second Family Skills Programme, and this is Family United. So this is a universal programme and not aimed at any specific families. Um, it's also very brief. You, I'm going to show you some slides now. It's over four weeks of sessions. It's also evidence informed. And like Strong Families, it's developed to be very light. The materials are light. The training, the training can be for lay facilitators with no psychological or um, such psych psychological backgrounds. And it's very cost effective as well. The philosophy of the Family United program really maps against the philosophy of the Strong Families program too. Every family has strengths and skills that they have learned through their journey of hardships together. Even in challenging times, caregivers will always want the best for their children. And when families share their strengths and their skills, families can make their life easier and can feel like they have a support network around them. Each family will know what's best and what will work in their situation. And all families are really encouraged to try all of the different techniques in this program. Here on the right hand side of the slide, you can see um, an illustration of the structure of the Family United program. As you can see immediately, it's one extra week than the Strong Families program. So this program runs over four weeks. And just like Strong Families, there are separate child sessions, caregiver sessions, for the first hour and then in the second hour children and caregivers come together and take part in a family session so for example in the caregiver sessions we look at understanding how to encourage children through praise through having um, different family rules in the in the house and different techniques that caregivers learn about as well caregivers will work on how to manage challenging behavior how to reduce undesirable behavior and how to promote the behavior that they want to see. In the child sessions, children will be looking at the positive qualities that they want for themselves in the future and how they can reach this. They will focus heavily in this program on developing skills on handling stress. So life skills that they can use now and in the future to better manage their emotions and their behavior. This intervention was really developed with um, making sure it's light touch and not just light touch, but it's light on resources as well and does not require a heavy infrastructure for implementation. A key part for this is the background of the facilitators that implement this program. This program does not need people to have a background in psychology 
or social work, what we really need is that the facilitators that take part in this intervention and go on to work with families have really good presentation skills, have a real passion and enthusiasm for supporting families and building their skills and have a really positive attitude and willingness to try all of the activities themselves um, exactly as the curriculum has written. We talked about parenting under stress and very related to that, physical distancing and the lockdowns due to the spread of COVID-19 have really left families facing a real struggle globally. Isolation, of course, can be a really good opportunity for caregivers to spend more time with their children and develop their relationship with them. But many parents, like myself, will have really experienced conflicting feelings and priorities, as well as real practical challenges in caring for our children during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's no surprise that COVID-19 is associated with parenting stress. And right from the start of the COVID-19 breakout, UNODC joined many other agencies and international organizations in recognizing um, the threats that the pandemic had on family well-being. And UNODC joined several global pledges to support families during this pandemic. So as you can see here, we've developed specific parenting support resources, such as basic leaflets and parenting information for families facing COVID generally, um, and also those in refugee contexts. These resources are open access and standalone and aim to meet the significant need of families globally um, as, as we're facing them together. So here we have on the left, the, the leaflets that's general for all families around the world. And then here we have in the middle of the leaflet that's specific to the refugee context. And then on the right hand side of this slide, you can see a booklet which has far more extensive information than the leaflet. The next three slides in my presentation are just um, an in-depth look a bit more at the booklet on COVID-19. It's very similar to the leaflet but with far more extensive information. So what your child might be experiencing, how you might support your child through providing safety, through providing warmth and support, through making time to talk to children. And there's also an extensive section on how to support teenagers during this time. So teenagers, often the biggest difference in, their, in how they act and how they feel is they want to have much more independence and control over their situation. And of course, in the context of COVID-19, where children may be isolated or unable to go out or go to school, this is even harder for children to manage. So there are some really good tips and information on how we can support children who are teenagers to make their own decisions about their safety, about their education, but also in a really healthy and supportive way. So you as a caregiver are supporting children to make good decisions um, but children are learning self-regulation skills. So this is a real key part of this booklet as well. So please do go and have a look at these resources on COVID-19. There will be a link at the end of this presentation which shows you where you can reach all the resources that UNODC has been developing for um, many, many years globally now, all over the world for Strong Families, Family United and these COVID-19 resources. So thank you for your attention. I am now going to hand over my presentation to Dr. Ha, who will give you much more information on the evaluation of the tools that I have described to you all today. Thank you. Um, thanks to Dr. Elhani and please welcome Dr. Karin Har. Uh, Dr. Har works as an international consultant in the prevention, treatment and rehabilitation section at the UNDC headquarters in Vienna. Dr. Har. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for having me here to present to you the results of the evaluation of our Family Seals programs. 
As my previous speaker, Dr. Malouf and Dr. El Khani already mentioned, I will focus on the topics and continue on what they have discussed within their presentations. Since 2010, UNODC has been working actively with more than 45 countries globally on family or life skills. And as you can see on this slide, um, all those who are marked in yellow are currently working with us. But despite it does not matter really where a child lives, the most important factor is that the need of a child or a family of a certain age, the child of a certain age, um, is the same, no matter where the, ch the child or the family lives. Worldwide, there are a number of very good evidence-based family skills training programs out there. Um, UNODC has published a compilation of those. However, many of those were not designed to be implemented in resource-poor countries. As Dr. Elhani mentioned, the Strong Families program was developed based on this and particularly targeting families living in humanitarian or challenged settings. Right now, the program is already available in a number of different languages, and you can see here the manual, the uh, facilitator manual has been translated and ha has been implemented in a number of different countries. As we speak, we are working on additional translations so it can be rolled out in other countries as well. You can see here, um, not many resources are needed to implement these programs. And often we have used schools to implement the programs because first of all, schools are ideal venues to uh, implement the program. And in addition, um, when you recruit families, you would like to, your, your aim to have children of a similar age in that, in your training program. And by doing that, of course, schools are ideal because children are of the same age groups. You can see here some examples from different countries. Not many resources are needed. As you can see, it can be really implemented with limited um, additional materials. It can also be performed outdoors, as you can see here in some remote islands in the Philippines. Some of the activities have been done outdoors and you can see that it has been um, you can see some photos from the facilitator trainings and it works likewise, no matter in which country we have implemented. I would like to show you now some results of strong families, which has first been piloted in Afghanistan. So between July and October 2018, 72 families from three different locations in Afghanistan have been chosen from Kabul, Herat and Masar -e sharif um, The demographics was that um, all of these caregivers were female, so they were all mothers to these children, but this was due to cultural reasons because it was not allowed that male and female caregivers uh, gather in one room. The children were about 10 years old and 92% of the families had experienced war or armed conflict in the past. So it really was a stressful situation for those families living in Afghanistan. I briefly want to introduce you to our data collection tools, which is the same for all the different results I will show you during my, my presentation. You can see in red, in the red box, this is the Strong Families Training Program. So this is when the facilitators work with the families for three weeks. One week before we meet them for their time one, the pre-intervention data collection, where we ask them to fill in a demographic questionnaire. In addition, families fill in an SDQ, so that's the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, which is a standardized questionnaire, and also the PAFAS, which is the Parent and Family Adjustment Scale. Two weeks after they have completed the program, so um, this is here, families come back to fill in again the SDQ and the PAFAS questionnaire, and again after six weeks after they have ended the program, they come back to fill in the SDQ and the PAFAS questionnaire. You can see here the first PAFAS results from Afghanistan. This is a lot of numbers and I don't want you to go into the details, but what you can see here are all the parenting subscales. You can see that we had significant changes, so everything marked in red, significant changes in scores in the positive direction on all the different subscales. And likewise, on the family adjustment subscales, we also had significant changes in all the different subscales. 
to, to show this in a more graphic display and to look at just one of the subscales, the coercive parenting subscale, we divided families by the scores at time one. So this is like a traffic light where families with most difficulties at start point are highlighted in red, the medium ones in, in yellow and the not so bad off ones in, in green. And you can clearly see that those with most problems at start point they reduced significantly in scores before and after the program. So time one is before the program, time two is two weeks after the program. So they significantly decreased in scores, which was maintained also six weeks after the program. If we look at the STQ and all um, the children, so in 72 children, they started off at fairly high levels before the program. So normally it is said that um, if you are above 17 points on the STQ, total STQ score, um, then you might display uh, clinical symptoms already of, of stress. Um, and here the average of the children was already around 18 points. But you can clearly see after the program, they reduced down to close to average category, almost 13 points, and even less six weeks after the program. So the program we assumed had a significant impact on, on these scores. Also, if we just look at children who were above 17 points at start point, so on average, they were around 21 points before the program, and they reduced significantly to almost the normal category after the program, but definitely six weeks after the program, they decreased massively in scores. And if we look at boys and girls separately, you can see that these two lines are parallel. So we can say that um, the um, program worked equally in boys and in girls. We've published these results in a peer-reviewed paper. You can just Google it by typing in Strong Families and Afghanistan. It's an open source publication and you can read all the details. The next country we implemented the Strong Families program in was Serbia. And there um, we recruited 25 families from three refugee reception centers in South Serbia. 92% of them had um, Afghanistan as their country of origin. And on average, they were about one year already living in that reception center. And again, more than 90% of these families had experienced war or armed conflict in their past. So they had also some stressful situation in their past. If we just look again at the coercive parenting subscale as an example, and um, again, families divided by their scores at time one, you can see that those with highest scores, so with the poorest outcome at start point, that they decreased significantly over time um, and almost came to the same levels as the other families. For the STQ, if we again look in the children in the very high or high category, so above 17 points, of course, we have a smaller sample size here. But nevertheless, we can see that after the program, particularly six weeks after the program, they came down to the close to average category after the program. We have also published these results in a peer reviewed paper, and there are also some qualitative results in there. So if you're interested, have a look. This is also open source. You can access it easily, and it's very interesting to, to read. Another country in your area I would like to show you where Strong Families was implemented was Uzbekistan. Um, there, um, 47 families in Tashkent city were recruited. Um, however, the demographic was a bit different in this context, as almost 50% of the parents had a university or even a postgraduate degree. Again, what you can see on the scores here for the STQ, there was not such a high, they were not really in the stressed category already before the, the program. So they were in the close to average category with 12 points, but nevertheless, after the program, they reduced to 10 points and which sustained even after six weeks, and they reduced significantly in scores after the program. Um, my colleague, Dr. Elhani, already has mentioned the details about the Family United program, which is our universal family skills program. And I would just like to show you some results um, from two countries. First of all was Bangladesh, where um, 29 families were selected from a high school in Dhaka, so in the capital 
on the PAFAS subscale, uh, on the coercive parenting, you can see that there was again a significant decrease in scores, um, particularly in families with high scores at start point. On the STQ, again, lower scores already to start off with. However, significant improvements also um, after the program. And on the CYRM, again, if you see those with worse scores at start point, they, again, the traffic light, they improved significantly over time um, on, the, on the CYRM subscore, oh, it's the total score, sorry. Um, if we look quickly at the Family United results from Indonesia, here again, we had an intervention group and the control group. And there you can clearly see intervention group, for example, positive encouragement subscale on the PAFAS intervention group had a significant um, decrease in scores, no effect in the control group. Again, on the STQ, they were all way in the close to average category, so around eight, nine points. But here again, strong effect in the intervention group, whereas no effect in the control group, as we have seen previously. CYRM, similar picture strong effect in the intervention group, no statistically significant effect in the control group. So we have now developed also an online platform for remote facilitator training. If you're interested, I don't have the time to present you the details, but please get back to us and ask us for the details on that. Um, and no matter which program you have in your area, they all complement each other. So all of these family skills programs are one part of the puzzle piece and uh, parenting is prevention by saying that we would all like to um, we all have a role to play in making a better world for our children and families and as you have heard previously family skills programs have an effect on a number of different domains by saying that i would like to thank you very much for your attendance and please email or contact us if you have any future questions thank you very much Thanks, thanks to Dr. Har to sharing her findings. And we have come to the end of our session. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the question and answers, but some of our speakers shared the emails and you contact, can contact them, or you can also leave your emails uh, if you want to receive answers to your questions. And to sum up, there is a range of uh, family skills programs and there is growing evidence that they can improve parenting skills and in turn the behavior, the well-being, the academic achievements of children. And experts strongly recommend to use evidence-based programs. And as Dr. Har said today, we all have a role to play in making a better world for children and families. Thank you to all our speakers today and Thank you for joining our session. Enjoy the rest of the conference.